Hi there, guys. Today we're in the interview room with, in my eyes, a legend, one of uh, Britain's best ever produced 110 high hurdler. Won many medals in many different competitions, gold, silver, bronze. He's had the hall. He's had all the colours you can imagine. And I think his first gold medal, I'm going to go back, was in 1987 for the junior. So welcome to the in room, Tony Jarrett. So, Tony, we're going to go back to the year. So when did you begin athletics and what got you into hurdling? Um, I began back in 80, well, probably 84, 85. Right. Um, but I've been hurt. You know, I, mean, I love sport, so um, I've been. You know, when I was at school, I loved sport. I loved uh, football. I loved basketball because of my height. I loved all kind of sports. But um, when it came to sports day, that's where I shut. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I just liked, you know, competing. And I remember doing like the the long jump, uh, high jump, uh, the hundred meters. And I, I did this thing called hurdles, but I had no technique. I just jumped up and down and just ran, and that was it. So it was just, I just loved the sport. And um, it just came in that way. And I was very fortunate one day, uh, sports day, um, my first coach there, John Isaac, was there just watching. And uh, he saw me and just came up to me and said, look, I, could, I want to coach you, and I think you could do well. So I thought, okay. And then, then he mentioned who he coached. And for me, it was like, it was like, wow, because I, I watched a lot of sport. And um, and the guy he mentioned to me, I remember just watching a guy called Mike McFarlane. Yes. And I, right. So I remember watching him in the Commonwealth Games, um, dead heating with Alan Wells. So I just remember what, when he said Mike McFarlane, I thought, you coach the Mike <laughs> McFarlane. So I thought, I'm on board. <laughs> I'm coming. I, come and, I said, listen, that's what I want to do. I, want, I said, if you're going to coach me and you coach Mike McFarlane, you got me. I'm coming. But and that's how it sort of started. Right. And then that's how you got into hurdling. Because it's not just uh, a hurdling, 110 hour. The three foot six, these, these hurdles. And, and for people not being it, I mean, I did a, a bit of hurdles back in when I used to fudge fraudy manias. And I think when I got in the blocks, because somebody said, yeah, I want you to do the hurdles. I thought, yeah, I did not look too bad. But I believe you mean, when I got in them blocks and I looked around the 10 flights of hurdles, I thought, my God, how high are these? And, and as you just said, it was just like jumping over, run. I do about five steps in between, between each other <laughs> and just try and jump over. I mean, you don't realise when you watch yourself on the on the television and that how graceful and how smooth and how low. You, it's like millimetres from the, on the oh. hurdles. So um, I, I've gone into hurdling a little bit more and I ended up being able to do three strides only between them. And I couldn't believe how much time you save by just doing three strides in between the hurdles from, from the five. So, mm. is it important for you as we come out the blocks? Is the first hurdle the most important hurdle? You know the funny thing is, I thought that. You know what I mean? I thought I used to think, all right, the first hurdles is important, and yes, it is because this is the first one you're you're gonna actually come up to. Is yeah. The first hurdle you're gonna negotiate, and but I always been, it's funny enough you say that because. Colin Jackson said something to me which really made me really think. He goes, he doesn't really think about the first hurdle. He concentrates on the second hurdle. And I thought, why did you do that? He goes, because I want to come at that first hurdle. You know it's normally eight strides yeah. or seven strides now these people are running at. And, but he goes, you know it's going to be there. It's not going to move. But what you want to do is come into hurdle two like a bat out of hell. <laughs> so I start to really, when you see me, you see athletes go up to the hurdle, like before the race, you got them go up to the first hurdle and they stand by it and they look down, down the line to right, like to the finish line. Yeah. I'm looking at the second hurdle thinking, I'm coming at you like a bat out of hell. So first hurdle is important because you want to make sure that, at the, you know, you're not hitting it and you're clearing it nicely and you're getting into the, your rhythm quickly. But I'm really looking at that second hurdle and thinking that's the one where I want to be coming in hard. But I want to get to, as the Americans would say, maximum velocity. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's brilliant to know because, as I said, I always heard the first hurdle was always the, to sort of get to that first hurdle and then set the rhythm up from there. But So it's interesting that you're saying, no, the second hurdle is what we, we worked on. Um, and obviously all through that, it's rhythm and stuff like that. But even um, with all your hurdles, you did the, the relay squads as well. So you did the four by one relays as well, didn't you? So you had the speed, because I believe you ran uh, 10.4, if I remember rightly, for 100 metres. Um, that, that, that was when I was a junior. 
Oh. So, I, know, I, I think really and truly, if I did stick at the 100 metres, because the funny thing is, when I met my coach, John Isaacs, who saved me really, and he really saved me, and I always got, oh, he's a blessing. And um, I wanted to be a 100 metre runner. Right. And he said, and I thought, listen, I want to do 100. He saw me hurling, but, but he said to, I said to him, look, I want to do 100 metres. And he goes, no, nah, you're going to do hurdles. And I said, why? He goes, well, it's easier in the British Championship, be in British Championship, to make a final in the hurdles than the 100 metres. So yeah. I looked at him like, what do you say that? I thought, what do you mean? He goes, well, he goes, not everybody can hurdle, but a lot of people can run in a straight line. Yeah. So I thought, okay, I thought, yeah. And what caught me was, he said, in Britain, to get into a major championship or into any like race, there's just heats and finals in the hurdles. Heats, finals. But in in the hundred meters, the heats, hand, two hand, three, then the final. There's more rounds in the hundred meters. But in the hurdles, there's always heats and finals in Britain. Because if you want to get on TV quicker, do the hurdles. So I thought, right, I'm on the hurdles. Well, it, it makes sense, but it's so, so technical. So mm. uh, back in when, obviously, your juniors and, and the senior level, uh, doing the highest level as you did, Obviously, you were a full-time athlete, so it must be so much time spent on drills, you know, getting the... Getting the so how how much time did you put into the technical side of the, the hurdles? Oh, man, you know, you have to be. If you want to make it in, especially in the hurdles, you have to put that time in. Um, you have to make sure your your flexibility, your mobility is good. Um, I, I did mobility at home. Um, I made sure, you know, I did it over chairs, you know, lead leg, trail leg. I made sure my technique, I worked on my technique because one of the things I found out was, is that I was fast. And when you said, like, um, going back to that last question, going to the, um, doing the relay, you know, yeah, I was fast. When I first started my hurdling, I was just fast. I was beating people, not technically, I was just beating them and running off a hurdle into the next. But people were catching me going over the hurdle. But then I would move away in between the hurdles. So I know I had the speed. But then what I, my coach realised, he said, well, look, we got to work your technique. And the, my lead leg was a bit dodgy. Trail leg was non-existent. So we really worked on that, that, my mobility to make sure I had a good lead leg, good trail leg, and, and, and coming off in the right positions off the hurdle. And when I, when I started to create those things, time seemed to start to drop so I can actually use my speed better when my technique was in in the right in the right doing the right thing. Right. So did you obviously your technique? Did you lot do stuff a lot of stuff in the gym and ply, did ply, a lot of plyometrics come into stuff? And how has it sort of structured your your training week? What was it like to structure it? Yeah, you know, we did. I did a lot of plyometrics. Um, the weights, I I believe weights. Yeah, I was strong. I think you need to be strong, but you don't have to be like. Hercules. <laughs> I mean, you just need to be, you know, to hold your body weight. Um, I remember the, the, the year, one year, I got really strong and I was, I was lifting up weights, PB in the, in the weights room, didn't run any faster. <laughs> I mean, I just looked good. I looked like Hercules. <laughs> but if I did, I ran slower. So, but when I'm, I'm, I'm lifting a good weight and, um, and my, I, I work more on power metrics because Hurdling is a power metrics. You're jumping up and down. So I worked more on that and to strengthen up my ankles, my hips, my calves. You know, so that was very important. And I do that, say, two, three times a week. We work on those things. Yeah. So what we're really looking at is that it's power to weight ratio is probably the most important then, isn't it? To keep light but keep strong. And as you say, you can go too bulky and end up, you know, your mobility would probably suffer a little bit there anyway. Absolutely. So if we, if we touch back on... Um, you know, your heyday and stuff like that, your world silvers, your gold medals and all that. What was it like going to, like, the world championships and stuff like that? I believe you're, um, was it Stuttgart, 13 flat? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, what a hell of a time. But what's it like going into competitions? How how do you deal with the pressure? We well, see, uh, going into competitions, it's, it's, it's something you go, because, like, before going to that world champs, I went to Olympic Games. Yeah. So, for me, my first Olympic Games was back in 1988, Seoul. Yeah. So, yeah. so, for me, that was, like, uh, amazing, just to make the Olympic Games. Yes. And what I did, you know, I set goals. I said, before that season, I remember sitting down with my coach, and I said, look, 
what's my, my goal is, what's our goal? He said, well, your goal is to make the Olympic Games. So I thought, right, that was my goal. I thought, right, to make that Games. When I made it, then I set my next goal. I said, well, I've got to run a fast time there, and then I want to make the final. Those were my two goals. When I made it, run a PB, made the final. And when I made the final, it was like, okay, my next goal, don't come last. <laughs> that was the next thing. But when I made that Olympic Games final, my brain kicked into thinking, well, I've made the Olympic final with the best in the world. Yeah. And I was probably 19 at that time. Wow, so, so young. Right. So for me, it was like going into Stuttgart, I've been competing. I've been competing already. So I've been to these championships. And what about Stuttgart? What made it great for us? Where What I loved about Stuttgart is that we were where we where we stayed was a dump. <laughs> I mean, the, the village was a dump, and we were just like we, you know, when we went into the room, we were like, "Oh my God, we can't stay here." And then we, when we went out, we had all these Americans were leaving the village and going to the five star hotels and all that stuff. And then what I loved about it, and we looked at Linford, and Linford said he's staying. So we said, "Oh, Linford's staying in the village. We're going to stay." And what that made, it made the team com camaraderie awesome. You know what I mean? So we all stayed in the village, helped each other. And I think mean, that's why I think why we had such a good World Champs that year. Because we stayed in there, we, we trained, everybody trained well. And I knew that I was in good shape. You know what I mean? I knew I was in good shape. But I, I, know, like, I had my training sessions was good. We used to go to Monte Carlo for uh, preparation um, for the games. And I was training, well, I trained, funny thing is, to go back, I was, I, I was training well. And I went to a meeting in Monte Carlo before the training camp. We had a training camp out, um, we usually just go there ourselves. And, and there was a meeting in Monte Carlo prior to the warm weather, the, the training camp. And I had a bad race, it was terrible. It was, it was, I'll tell you, it was disastrous. And I came about fifth, and I think I had about a week and a half going getting to get ready for this world champ. So I was in a bit of a downer. But um, I just had a, out there, I had just a good training session. We did a, I did a couple of sessions with Colin, and I know, you know, I was there and doing about, and he asked me to come in and do a sharp couple of starts and stuff with him. And in my mind, I thought, well, I'm starting to, I know, training was going well after the back race. And then everything started to click. And I think when we went to the village and we stayed and, uh, I had my room partner John Regis. We just we just clicked, and the whole atmosphere of that 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 stadium was just awesome. You know, what I mean? and I think that's how we performed as well. Oh no, it was it was fantastic. Um, and you're just touching on there because you were saying about you had a bad 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 race out, but then the week later it changed. It just that's athletics, isn't it? I mean, I've had bad training sessions or a bad race. The next time you just bounce back. You go, well, how's 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 that just clicked? Why is it so different? Well. <clears throat> I suppose sometimes you're raising the game for a, a major championships um, like that. Um, so, as we've gone on from, from that now, uh, on all your success, when did you actually retire from the senior athletes? When did you say, that's it, I'm not running for Great Britain or England anymore? <laughs> I, think it, um, I think after 2003 or four, um, what happened, it, you know, I think the main thing was I tore my crucial ligament in my knee mm. in a race in Glasgow. And, and I knew I should have run that race. It was just, you know, we left London, it was nice and sunny. <laughs> Got to Glasgow, the next day it was chucking down with rain. It was horrible. And, um, and I didn't warm up as well because it, the, where we, the, we normally train was like a, on a, a football field. Uh, and it was all muddy and waterlogged. So we had to train in warm up in the changing rooms and in the hallway. So my my warm up preparation wasn't good. And I remember going over a hurdle, I think two, and I thought, okay, I was slightly down. And then I thought, right, I need to kick in. And as I went to drive my my uh, trolley down to to get momentum off a hurdle, I heard my knees go pop, mm. and I crashed into hurdle three, and then that was it. And I had an operation. Um, to sort it out, uh, try to come back, but what happened? Because it was on my trail leg side, my knee, I couldn't get my trail leg tight enough. 
like my heels were bummed. Uh, it was sort of wide, so when I got over here, I'll be clipping it slightly because my trailer was opened. So I had another operation uh, to get it to get close to get my heel close to my bum, uh, and then I tried to come back. Then I think my brain told me, you know, something told me it's. I think it's an end. Yeah, no, I think because I tried to come back and just the the motivation wasn't there anymore, uh, and then. I started to think, even going into that, and before I got injured, I used to, you know, I was missing out in finals. I would, you know, I a full start, or I would drift to the side of the hurdles, and I wasn't running the way I want to run. Yeah. Now, the thing I, I knew is that I, think, well, I can make championships. I, I think I could make championships, but do I think I could make a final? And if I couldn't make a final, then for me, it's no point. So I had to really sit back when I was injured. I really sit back and contemplate. I'm thinking, is it worth coming back, or should I just call it a day? And I looked back. I looked at my medals. Looked at what I've done, and I thought, you know something, I've done well. And I don't want to be an athlete where I just keep running bad and bad, and people are looking at me thinking, just retire. So I'm <laughs> yeah. Before somebody comes to me and told me retire, just call it a day. So that was, that was it for me. Now, I think it was 90, 2003, 2003, 2004. That time. So after you've retired, obviously I've seen that you have your academy now, isn't it, for younger athletes? So you've gone into the coaching aspect of things now. Mm. Yeah, um, we've got. I've got a young academy I have with, uh, which is my business partner, um, Johnny Frankis, called uh, 110 BYL. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, um, and we're just looking to try to get athletes. For me, one of the main things is trying to get athletes to achieve what I achieved and better. You know, and that's the main thing for me. I want to, I want someone to, to feel the same thing I felt. I, I had a lovely career. I enjoyed every bit of it, and I want someone to feel, some athlete to feel the same thing, and 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 do better. You know, and that's what got me into athletics because a coaching really. Because at first, when I retired, I didn't want to do nothing with coaching. Nothing. I said somebody asked me, and they said, "Do you want to do coaching?" I said, "No, no, not interested. No way. I want to do it." Then. Um, Mike McFarlane um, had a sprints and hurdle coach in Brunel, um, uh, a course, and then he asked me, can I come and help out with the hurdles side of it? So when I went there and saw the next generation of hurdles, young hurdles, it shocked me, because I was like, older one. For me, it was like, looks at them. There were some ones that were quite good, but the majority of them, I was like, oh my God, I was like, is this the next generation trying to come to try to do what Colin and I did? Then it's not going to happen. So I was watching them and, uh, and I, I like to see bad technique. I was like, oh my God, you know, you're not going to. For me, it was like, nah, that's not going to happen. So one of the actual coaches there actually uh, kept talking to me mm. and, and talked to, talking to me about exactly and asking me for advice. So I sort of said to him, said, well, this is what he needs to do. He had a reasonable leg, good lead leg, but a poor trail leg, you know what I mean? And he was, good thing about it, he was quite tall. He was about the same height as me, six, one, six, two. So I said, he's tall, but he, his trail leg is kind of poor. Lead leg is okay, but he needs a lot of work. And he's running, and his actual running technique is bad. So I remember just talking to him about that, and, and I just left it. Then, unknown to me, that young athlete, was a good youth, you know what I mean? He was a good youth. So I think, and coming into juniors, and I remember Rob Denmark was looking after the British athletes, looking after the young talents coming through. So I remember Rob Denmark contacting me and saying, look, I heard that he spoke to, um, I think the coach's name is Dave, I can't remember his second name, but the young man with Johnny Frankis, who I coached, and he said, look, I heard that you were speaking to him. Would you like to coach him? And at first I was like, no, I'm not interested. He goes, no, I think he needs your help. And the coach said, like, I've got him this far. I need some help with him. Can you help him out? So I thought, all right, took that on and never looked back. <laughs> 15, 16 yeah, years. Never yeah, yeah. Back. I think what it is, you get the bug. And I think the other thing, when you see someone doing so well and all yeah. your knowledge, then it, it, I suppose it's a part of that thing that if I see someone doing well, and especially if you've coached, you've just got, it gives you that buzz back, doesn't it? That's a little bit of the buzz. Oh, no, definitely, because like you know, for me, it was just seeing him develop. Because um, 
seen Johnny develop, it was just amazing because he was a very good learner. What was good about him, everything we taught him, we worked on the training, we worked on his mobility, and, and every year he got from a good youth, a good junior, went to under 23, he's good, and then he went to seniors, could have been better, but certain things didn't happen, but he, he, he was making progress all the way, he was getting faster. When you see people you're actually getting faster and improving and winning, you just think the bus is there. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't even bad laughing about it. It's like there were days where, I remember when he, met, he got a silver medal on the under 23s. And remember, he had a great warm up and he trained, you know, great warm up um, um, preparation for the race. And I was nervous for him. <laughs> so I was like, shaking. And I was like, Jesus, you know, you know, you know this, is, this is your, your running. And I looked at him and I said, look, let me just run with you because I, I've got the nerves here. I, I can't be running with you. I'm just standing there like that, doing a race cap, but the dream was going, I was pumping, my heart was pumping, nervous for him. And just to see him do well, just for me, it was just like, wow. You know, I thought, wow, I want more now. I want to help more people achieve the same thing he did. Hence, that's what you. What's what you're doing now. It's what you're doing today. And the good thing about uh, that I love about Tony is that you are actually helping massive, massive athletes. Where I'm thinking, you know, you might be thinking, well, they're not really, you, you know. So how have you gone about helping the, the massive athletics, which is a little bit different from bringing your youngsters in? Well, I, just, I just love to see them. I'm just inspired by the truth. You know what I mean? Because I mean, you're still going. <laughs> How are you doing it? Because, like, my body cannot do what you guys do, you know what I mean? <laughs> and when I saw Donald, I helped out Donald, then I was just amazed by how Donald, how he's earning, how he's speeding, how he's running. And it inspired me. I'm like, man, I would love to help you out to achieve what you want to achieve, you know what I mean? It's just amazing. And I just put my hands up and before like, you guys are. I can't, I don't know how you do it. But I, I remember somebody asking me. And I was like, no, there's no way. Because I, I couldn't put my body through that pain, the, 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 the lactic, the, 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 oh, the pain, the training, the training. If you told me I could be in great shape and just turn up onto the track, not a problem. But to put so, myself through that training, no. Nah. Well, I think the difference is for you because you've come in at such a young age. When you've been at the, the level you've been at, sometimes you just think, you know, enough's enough. And you've obviously had some serious injuries along the way. So <clears> sometimes <throat> enough's enough. I know a, a, an athlete that you might have competed against. Uh, I'll bring you the name up. Willie Galt. Oh, yeah, yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. Right. Oh. So, so Willie Galt has carried up and he's actually in the Masters and he's done yeah. the world records for yeah. the 100 and 200. But he was obviously... Um, a hurdler as well back in the day when you used to compete. Um, Absolutely. he's been amazing and he's kept going. I'm like, flipping out Willie Gold from America, he's still breaking world records. So I don't know how he's kept going where he has. It's been brilliant for, for him. Um, <clears throat> so for you, no, it's been fantastic to watch you support the Masters Athletics <clears throat> and, and, and help them guys. But does do they look do the youngsters look at the Masters athletes and think, wow, they're still doing it, do they set an example to them? Yeah, because I will show them, you know, when I'm at the track and I see the masters there, some of the guys say, look, these guys are masters, you know what I mean? They're doing their masters after, you know what I mean? And they're still competing, you know what I mean? But I think it's for, for young kids, you know, especially like uh, Donald and, uh, and Mensa and um, Gary. And yeah. when, these, when my athletes, when my athletes see these guys and I talk to them, they, they look at me and they go, they're still competing. I say, yeah, they're competing. And they're doing really well. They're winning medals. You know, they're going to championships. They're like, wow. And they're asking, why are you doing this coach? I'm like, no. We're <laughs> retired. But the funny thing you said about Willie Gold, I met Willie Gold in LA. Um, oh, gosh. What year was that? Probably, I forgot what year it was. But Willie Gold was still running 200. And he beat some of some young athletes in the 200. So I knew he was going to run well. I said, I couldn't believe I saw him at his track. Um, and I, at that time I was training Johnny, so I took Johnny to warm up a training in LA. And I uh, went there and I saw this guy, I'm looking at him, that guy looks familiar. Then I looked at him, he's really good. So I'm like, what are you doing there? So I'm, I'm talking to him like, oh, he's coaching and stuff. He goes, no, he's competing. So I'm looking like, you still competing? He goes, yeah. He ran a 200. And I'm telling you, some of these young athletes out there, he was actually sloping them. So when he got to that, I looked at him thinking, 
Yeah, I could understand he's going to be grateful. He's still looks young. He hasn't changed much. <laughs> no, he hasn't. I mean, I, I was fortunate. I met Willie Gold in America when I was over there at the World Championships when I was competing over there. So I got introduced to Willie Gold. Uh, and I was like, and then obviously I researched who Willie Gold was and it was like, I think he ran like a 9-8 windy 100 metres. And, you know, he was he was phenomenal and, and, and did NFL as well for the, the yeah. National League over there, American football there. So it was like, wow. So, it, out of uh, British athletics itself, do we have any uh, characters that you went away with? You thinking they're always going to be a character? I mean, everyone else looks at Chris Crick as being a, a a big character, but is there any other characters in the the GB squad in your time? Oh, we had a lot of characters, man. We had like Liam was the biggest character to me. You know, because he, he, Liam was walking the swagger. You know what I mean? He was such a swagger, man. You're just thinking, gee, look at the swagger on this guy. So, Lou was a character. Um, I don't know. Yeah, just like, just, 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 are six two six three six four? You're a good earner. You know, you can be a good earner. You know, you die. It's better. It's better for you. If you're taller, it's better for you. But it's not always the beginning and the end. Because I know I had my training partner, UVT, um, and he was probably about five and nine. And he made it in the final. <laughs> so back in '92, Barcelona. But and the reason, the reason, don't think I think the reason why team major like the new and did well for his height is because he had a good technique and then we worked his speed. And when he started to work his speed and his technique came in, then he came on and he did well. But I think he would have got to a certain point. And that height would only get to a certain point, I think. And if you're a taller earner, yeah, you know, you look at these guys now, they're all in the 6'2", 6'3", high bracket. And um, I think Conley was about 6'4". I think um, Alan Johnson was 5'11". So you can get away with that height. But anything like 5'8", 5 especially at 3'6", because the first thing you're going to do when you come to her, your hip position is going to be high. So a tall hurdle can get away from dropping the hips a little bit. Because, because your hips are there, you know, you've got room. <clears throat> but for a short hurdle, if you drop your hips in between the hurdle and go into the hurdle, the first thing you're going to do is pop straight out of the hurdle and try to go that way. And you want to go that way across the hurdle. Yeah, because so, yeah, when, when you watch it on the television, there's hardly any differential yeah. between the heights. It's pretty much, you go straight, nice and smooth right across the hurdles. And exactly. Then, and go and on, you see it. what you see. When you see the, if you haven't got that height and you're not standing tall, your your vertical is going to be more up that way mm. and more horizontal when you're actually attacking the hurdle. And if you're going that way and I'm going that way, there's only one winner. There's only going to be one winner. So I would say, you know, we have to look for hurdles at a, a good height. A good height. The girls can get away with it. The hurdles are so low. Girls can get away with smaller, you know, short hurdles because they need to make the hurdles up because they can get away with it. But um, and if you're tall, tall for a, a woman hurdler, then you might have a. I'm not saying you might be at a slightly disadvantage because you're striving in between. You've got to chop like a beast in between the hurdles to get that ribbon. Where if you're short, you can just actually run in between. Yeah, well, I think the good thing was with Masters, at least when we get older, the hurdle height drops because three foot six was was a nightmare. Um, I, I've gone to 50 now and I, they've come down to, I think it's three three foot three or maybe three foot now. But even I can get over them not too bad now. I'm thinking, oh, I, look, I look like an hurdle a little bit now, but them three foot six, honest to God, just, just amazing how you guys got over them. It really was. Have you got any tips for us with hurdle? I know you're a coach, but it'd be great to have you get any tips, especially for the Masters athletes as we're getting older. Well, you know, I think for the tips now, it's like, for the Masters, it's really just be 
No, no your body. body. You know what I mean? No one's no your body is doing, doing and, and, you know, you know you're getting older, older, you don't, you don't have to do as much, much work. work. <laughs> you don't <laughs> have to hammer it out, and, you know, and, and you've got to know the body, body make sure that, 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 you know, you stay away from injuries, and then you do get into the long to cover. And definitely work your mobility, especially for herbs. You definitely got to keep that mobility going, because if you don't, I always, I always say, say if, if you, you got, got tight uh, and you a knee leg, leg, I didn't catch that. Sorry, sorry. Sorry. Um, if, if you got, got a tight hand and knee leg and trailing, trailing, you would find, find that, that you would, you would, you would you're your your batting over a hurdle. Yeah. You, you want to float over a hurdle. You don't, you don't, you don't want to be fighting in the knee leg, fighting in the trailer. If you do that, you're burning a whole new energy. Whole new energy. You want to make you see the top hurdles. They're learning smoothly. They're saving energy over and, over and, and, and top, top of the hurdle, imaging the hurdle. They're, they're not, not wasting energy trying, trying to, you know, to get, get over it. it. They're just using their, their, their mobility and their, their skills, skills to get, get over, over it, it, not burning energy. So, so like for young, young athletes, athletes, you've got to make sure that your technique is sound. sound. If your technique is not sound, you're going to have a problem. Especially because of you. At, at a young, young age, age. you got to get, get in early. early. Because, because you got, you've got, got young juniors, you've got very good juniors, you've got very good juniors. And the funny thing, when, when, when I was a junior, three foot six, six was a high. You know, we were early on three foot six as a junior. So, what's happening? A lot of these young kids are they learning the juniors. So, they're losing the transition from three three to three six. And what happened, three six would Touch you out. out. <laughs> it was slash out your technique. Your technique, if your technique is not good, good the hurdles will talk to you. you. you, you hit them and say, this is your trail is not good. good. If you're not looking at any leg up, we hit them and they will tell you. The hurdles will tell you, no, you're not negotiating this barrier properly. So you've got to make sure your hurdling is very efficient so that you can get over it and level by two things. I'll tell you. And what, what I think the athletes, athletes are losing. losing. If you look at, oh, I'm, I'm going to, um, uh, Donald Brown. Brown. If you look at Donald Brown, Brown. why Donald, Donald Brown is so good? good. Watch what how he runs at 60 meters. Watch how he runs at 100 meters. Yeah, he does a sprint. Sprint is in five. It's vital. Now, a lot of these athletes are not sprinting. You understand? understand? And if you look at great athletes, athletes in my era, they were good, good sprinters. sprinters. I'll, I'll give you a final example. example. Gail Stevens, she ran 1082. <laughs> should have been the world record holder. <laughs> should have been the world record holder. But, but poor, poor technique, technique. Yeah, poor, poor technique. technique. That, that was a problem. problem. She had poor technique, technique because that was a problem. problem. The technique was bad, but their speed alone should have been the world record holder. Sally Pearson can run 1114 speed. You understand? So, Speed is key, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Give me a minute. I'm calling him man. 649. Speed. For me, I don't understand these people. I don't understand. No, 100 meters or 200 meters. You know what I mean? Because I remember when I went to my first Olympic Games, and it was like a light bulb moment. I remember Brandon came in the start of my room, and I picked up the start of my room, and he said on the top, 110 sprint hurdles. Didn't say 110 hurdles. He said 110 sprint hurdles. So that's pretty good. If you're not fast, you can't run a sprint. Yeah, you can't run a sprint. You're going to be in trouble. You know what I mean? I'm not saying he's not going to be in the end. He's 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 going to be in the end. And you've got, got, and his technique, technique is not great. great. You know, no, he's, he's got, got poor technique. technique. He's got poor technique. Jeez, let me have a look at him. I have no, 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 no,
Oh, but what, what I remember when we went to Florida, Florida I actually saw him in the cup, trained, trained by Bob Johnson, Johnson and, and we did an assault in the session. What David Bollock has got, he's got good rhythm and mechanics in between her. He can hold a sweet rhythm from her one to her ten. It doesn't change. You hit it. When you see mine, you can see the little rhythm in between. He's holding that nice. That's what you got. If you're not fast, you might have good Rhythm, rhythm mechanics. mechanics. If you haven't got that, that, it's not happening. But, but I always, always say, it. speed, if you've got, got speed, you're halfway there. Oh, well, there you go. There, there's uh, the wisdom from the great man we had before us. Uh, Tony Jarrett, it's been, it's been a pleasure having that, a little bit of time with you and in, interviewing you. Um, and uh, I hope people at, back at the, the Masters Grand Prix now will be liking how's Darren got Tony Jarrett on here, but there you go. <laughs> it, it's, been, it's been a privilege to have you on, Tony. So, um, Look forward to your, some of your af- athletes uh, progressing through, and I might see them one day on the in the Olympic Games. And we'll hear now, coached by Tony Jarrett. So <laughs> I hope one day that comes for you. And in the meantime, if we can help any of the Masters athletes out there, then that's that's fantastic as well. If any Master athlete wants some help, go on my website www.110byl. And I'll help you out. No problem. I love coaching and I love helping people out. You're doing an awesome job, you know, and you know, you guys, I admire you guys, seriously, I don't know, you know, when I see you guys, I can cheese, my God, I'll take my hat off, I'll win this one. Oh yeah, well, we know why you've got your hat on, but we won't go into that. No, it's been a privilege, Tony, and thank you for coming on to this talk show. Brilliant. Thank you. All right, you take care, thank you. No problem.